I'm not pulling on my driveway. We all know what that means. It's time for another Drive to Work at Home Edition. Okay, so today I have Corey Bowen, and we're going to talk about the set design of Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate. <laughs> hey, Corey. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Okay, so I know you were on the vision design team, but you also led the set design team. So we're going to talk about set design today. So we're going to, basically our story is going to start when vision design hands over the set to you. Uh, and so I want to talk about different pieces of it. And you talk about how it got from where it started in the beginning of set design to how it got to the, you know, the printed version. So sure, yeah. let's start by talking backgrounds. So mm. when vision design handed over the file, backgrounds existed, but let, where, where were they when they got handed over? Backgrounds were really tricky when they were handed over. I remember a lot of where they were through vision. I'm trying to remember where they were when they were handed over. Um, I believe we were messing with this space where uh, you had a legendary creature, and they were, it was called like story background or story backstory for a long time, um, where your legend would have story and the backgrounds were called backstories. So we, um, yeah, for some flexibility reasons, but, uh, for story backstory for a while, the story legends included backstories within them. So if I had this card that, um, was a story, so it could have a backstory. It also had a little separate ability that was a backstory. If you were using it as a backstory in the command zone, there's also this, this whole thing where if you had a backstory in the command zone, the way it worked is like once per game, you could pay its cost to add its ability text to your commander forever. So it was more like this this one-time cost that you'd use to upgrade your commander. Very different than what it is now. Right, it's like Monstrosity uh, maybe is a good example, right? Like once per game, yeah. you could pay this mana and add add this ability. Yeah, Monstrosity is very close. But if, you, you know, if your commander died or went back to the command zone, it would retain this upgrade. Um, but we, we messed around with that. I think that's where we were leaving off mostly from vision um we had a lot of iterations of that kind of stuff um yeah and, and we messed around with different stuff like that you know at some point we were calling them feats instead of backstories um we were just uh swapping different iterations trying to get that to work trying to get the text space to work one of the issues was oh i have this story legend and it also has an ability that was the backstory and so it had to have two interesting abilities and that was really confusing or, um, or it just crowded the text box, and so we didn't have a lot of space to communicate everything. Um, eventually, through set design, uh, maybe like a quarter or a third of the way in, we had what I call a like return to normal cardboard, where we just um, try to outfit the mechanic more to where it is now, where it's enchantments in the command zone, and there are separate cards, and they work like a mechanic that you expect them to work like. So we were... we're Test from from vision and from early uh, set design, we were testing a lot of super novel weirdo space. I think at at one point I was thinking about like I don't know if I can say this on this podcast. <laughs> um, let's just say that we returned to normal cardboard, and it, it made a lot more sense. It still had the high resonant feel, um, and uh, we just kept iterating from from there. So yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting to talk about, just touch on for a second, is why why a set like Commander Legends needs something like background. Can we talk about that for a little bit? What, oh, yeah. What, what, so, what's, what purpose does it serve? Yeah. So, you know, draft in general as a format has this very cool thing where if I'm drafting red cards and green cards, and I realize that my green cards aren't as good as the blue cards coming to me, I might want to pivot over to blue-red um, and start picking more blue cards. And that kind of flexibility, that, that ability to pivot is really crucial to the fun and structure of draft. So in commander draft, you have this really great thing where, oh, um, I can only build decks to my commander's color identity. So if I, have a, if I had a red-green legend, I know I'm building red-green. And if I notice my green is not coming along and I have good blue cards, I could start picking those blue cards, but my flexibility is really limited until I get a blue-red legendary creature, um, which is a lot harder than it thinks. And so in Commander Legends 1, their solution was partner. 
And in that set, there was a bunch of monocolor legends um, that had partners. So you, if I had a red legend and a green legend, I would feel like, hey, I can pick red green cards. I can feel like I can reliably pick a red and a green legend because there's plentiful monocolor legends that link up. Um, and if I wanted to switch to blue, I would feel fairly confident in um, being able to find a blue partner that would be able to connect to my red partner or whatever. Um, and then so that flexibility of having those two commanders to assemble your color identity rather than be sent on a quest for a very specific color identity, like a card with a very specific color identity, um, is really, really good. Um, and so in Commander Legends 2, Battle for Baldur's Gates, uh, we have this dynamic where partners are a little uh, troubling to balance for constructed. The more partners there are in existence, the harder it is to balance them or play test them with every other partner. And theory crafts, is that fine? Is that fun? Is that fair? Um, so we wanted to try to do a spin-off partner because we thought the structure of the two-part command zone worked really, really well for flexibility in your color identity. Um, and we came up with this idea of, uh, I mean, her partner back or uh, choose a background really came from the idea of customizing your commander with a color identity. This is my legendary creature, but like in D and D, I have some influence on their on their character qualities. And in this case, it's it's backstory, it's background. I'm playing this card, but I'm deciding that you know, flavorfully I'm a criminal, or flavorfully I'm like a crafter, or flavorfully I'm a chef, or whatever. Um, and so that there's a lot of fun in D and D there that that came in with this flexibility drafting mechanic okay so let's talk another mechanic uh initiative do you, do you remember where initiative got handed off yeah so we we would try several different you know oh wait, so wait, wait. Initiative, but, but before yeah. you tell the story let me real quick for the audience that just initiative is this ability where you get a card kind of like the monarch you take the initiative and then when you take the initiative it allows you to venture into a specific dungeon called the undercity um, or if you're already in a dungeon, further go through the dungeon you're in. Um, okay, so that's what it is. Let's talk about how we, how, how, how you got there. Yeah, Vision handed off, I believe, that very basic ground level idea of what if we had, and at that time I think we were calling it the torch, but what if we had the torch? This is the monarch, but you get to venture into a dungeon. Um, and that was like pretty top line, you know, that's what it is. Um, obviously, it's, there's a lot more going on with it, but that's what it is. That's what Fish is like, hey, this could be cool. And I was like, this is cool. I like this idea a lot. I like how it marries the commander limited, like, you know, Monarch's such a fun mechanic. I like how it marries that kind of gameplay with uh, the dungeons from AFR in a satisfying way. Um, and then throughout set design, I think most of that mechanic, you know, we knew that it was Monarch Venture Dungeon thing but we didn't know what the timing was. Was it going to do end step as well? You know, was, uh, was it going to work with old venture cards? Uh, you know, it's timing. Monarch triggers just on your end step, but this card triggers so it's on your upkeep if you kept it, or it's whenever you take it. So if I hit someone with it, I trigger it immediately. Or if I already have it and I play a card that takes the initiative, I still get to venture, which is unlike the Monarch. In the Monarch, you have this thing where you uh, want to play a Monarch deck, uh, you put a bunch of cards that become the Monarch, and then you're like, I, you know, the Monarch creates a sub-game where, like, I enjoy hitting people, so evasive creatures are good for me. And in my Monarch deck, um, that, that kind of little mini-game I create in the, in the world, um, I end up not playing as much, because if, if someone takes the Monarch from me, I don't need to hit them. I just am going to play one of my many Become the Monarch cards, because I put all of the cards that become the Monarch together. And I'm incentivized to hold those cards in my hand until I lose the Monarch, so I forever have the Monarch without really interacting with anyone. So with the Venture or the Initiative cards, a lot of the idea, and then something born from set design, was that uh, if I want to play a dungeon-heavy deck with a lot of Initiative cards, I want to make these cards so that if I already have the Initiative, I don't want to hold these in my hand. I want to be proactive. I want to play them because I have an incentive to now, now if I play them, I, I still get to venture, you know, I don't need to wait to hold it back. I still can wait in case someone, I think someone's going to take it from me, but I have this proactive play ready. So that's a huge difference between Monarch and initiative that I, I really enjoyed. And obviously dungeons are, dungeons are a lot. Dungeons are a lot to design. 
a lot of different little things, a lot of different iterations. Um, so the dungeon really changed a lot late set design. I think more early to mid set design, we were figuring out the intricacies of the initiative itself. And once we were like, okay, we're pretty solid. This is what it is. Let's just really start iterating on this dungeon again um, to really figure out its final final resting place. So, so that dungeon, um, you know, I really loved the first mode being get a land. Um, and I really loved goad being somewhere. Um, but that one dungeon, it really had a lot of iteration later in the set design. So was it always from the, as far as set design, it always was his own dungeon, right? You, it, it, always, it wasn't, it was, it, was in, it was never like venture into the dungeon was what happened. It was always venture into the un Undercity or whatever, the, you know, you guys called it. Yeah, I mean, the exact specifics of venture into the Undercity was tricky. I think there may have been, maybe when we first were thinking of it, we were thinking about multiple dungeons. I think myself personally, I was very headstrong on one dungeon very early on. Um, I felt like if there was multiple dungeons, I didn't want to, I didn't want like one, when one card enters the game, this means everyone has to know all of the dungeons and have to be able to make a choice of which dungeon they're going into. That really frustrated me. I didn't want player A to play, to take the initiative. And suddenly now player B has to really think about which of the three or five or whatever dungeons they need to enter. That felt um, like really, really taxing choice to me. Um, and I like this other dynamic where if there's only one dungeon and you know you're entering it, you don't have to make any choices when you enter it. There's only one entrance room. Um, and then if you have a one big dungeon game aid piece, you can put it in the middle of the table and just track everyone's progress on it. You don't. Everyone doesn't need their own separate reminder. You can just track everyone's progress on one single dungeon reminder piece. And it feels like you're all in the same dungeon even though you're kind of in separate instances of it, but I thought that was really lovely as well. So what is, like a lot of the fine tuning was making the dungeon, you think? Like what, what was the biggest part of set design with, with the mechanic? With this mechanic specifically, yeah. um, this mechanic was a beast all the way through. I mean, again, in the beginning it was figuring out the cards that take the initiative and what the timing was. In the middle it was, you know, discussing with MTGO and other uh, stakeholders on like how was this mechanic going to work how was this dungeon going to work um, how is this going to work with uh, previous venture cards and then later on it's you know what are the specifics of the dungeon every step of the way we were iterating on what the specifics of the dungeon were but really most of that stride was late but I don't know this mechanic was being chiseled on and worked on basically every single week okay so let's go to another mechanic uh, adventure. So do, do you remember the state adventure got handed over? Yeah. I mean, I, adventure seems pretty, was pretty cut and clean. Adventure got handed over saying, Hey, we think adventure is cool and awesome and fits with pretty good themes. Also we can do adventure on like artifacts and enchantments and stuff. And I was like, yes, that is cool. It is sweets. There are themes we can make that marry with adventure. Um, so adventure was just kind of, had a lot of high confidence all the way through and then um at some point i started making limited cards that would like marry dragons and adventures because often we had our dragons have adventures and so um those combining some cards that made you want to play adventures and dragons or adventures or dragons was really cool as well but but in general adventure was just vision handed off saying you should use adventure and i said okay i will use adventure there's a little bit of trepidation in using adventure and adventure but um, I believe we got over it. So when it was handed over, okay, so the finished product, there are adventure on creatures and there's adventures on spells. Uh, not spells, on um, artifacts. Yeah. Um, but you you mentioned enchantments. I know there, there was more stuff that was explored as far as other kinds of things. Um, oh, for starters, just so the audience understands, um, the flavor you guys approached, like in Eldraine, where adventures first showed up, you met the creature that went on the adventure, right? The the creature that you could cast was the creature that went on the adventure. But you guys did something a little bit different, which is you, the player, are going on the adventure, and the the permanent represents things you will encounter or find on your adventure. 
Yeah, that is that is a lot of the idea is that you will go on this adventure and you will encounter this monster or this magic item or whatever. Um, I don't think this is 100% consistent. There's a lot of dragons in this set where it just makes more sense that that dragon's attack is the adventure. Mm -hmm. But um, even then, you could read it as, I've been attacked by this. That's my adventure. This is what is mm -hmm. attacking me. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the general idea. And there were, there were, I believe, enchantments with adventure in the vision handoff. I just wanted to streamline it more towards the magic items because I thought they were more resonant. So I uh, went with creatures and artifacts. Yeah, I sort of find the, the the magical artifacts, uh, the, the idea that you find treasure in your adventures, I think is really cute. Mm -hmm. Okay, next, let's talk about um, Myriad. So I believe there was no Myriad in the set, correct, when it was handed off? Yeah, there was no Myriad in the set. The set was handed off with um, melee, actually. Melee is a mechanic where a creature of melee gets plus one, plus one for each opponent you're attacking. Um, and there was one, one tokens with melee in the vision handoff. So the idea was, hey, we think we can do a red-white deck that, you know, can still scale aggro in multiplayer pretty decently with melee. Um, and I liked, I liked the melee tokens, um, but after thinking about it, I thought that Myriad was, I don't know, I thought it was cooler. I thought it was cooler. I thought it had more opportunities for a synergy with a big set like this with so many potential commanders. One of the things I was always thinking about was getting mechanics that had a lot of potential to hook into different synergies. And melee has so much going on in that aspect. Um, Can sorry, Myriad. Uh, let me explain what Myriad is, just for those who might not know what Myriad is. So this is the, the rule text, a reminder text from Myriad. Uh, whenever this creature attacks, for each opponent other than defending player, you may create a token that's a copy of this creature that's tapped in attacking that player or a planeswalker they control. Exile the tokens at end of combat. Right. So um, if, ima imagine you have a 1-1 one -one with Myriad. Essentially, the text means when I attack, I'm attacking everyone um, with different copies of myself. Um, but it had a lot of synergy with tokens, and then synergies with sacrificing, and then synergies with attacking, and then synergies with going wide, and we're leaving the battlefield. So there's a lot of fun stuff to do. Um, yeah, and then uh, creatively, we like the idea for a myriad of cards to represent, like, traveling parties. Um, you know, sometimes playing a D&D &D RPG, or just D&Ds in general, and you have your party full of different you know classes and whatever but sometimes you run along and yeah here's a group of cultists or here's a group of like guards and so you know parties and traveling groups are very common in D, &D so we thought it was cool to represent the myriad uh cards as groups of uh things and roles and such and such also something i want to point out uh you've done a lot of design on various commander pro products and commander decks and stuff um, but this is the first time you led a set design of a, of a booster product, correct? Yeah, no, I've done, um, I think up to that point, I, I had done like 20 or so um, Commander Precon releases or Precon decks. I, but I've done a lot of Commander Precon leading, and this was my first booster set, which is, uh, maybe the viewers don't really get it, but it's a huge difference, a huge different workload. You know, there's like, 360 cards to make in an environment to consider consider and consider them in. Um, so it was a much, much bigger project. Okay, so let's move on to talk another uh, element of the set, uh, dice rolling. So was dice rolling always there when Vision handed it off? Was there dice rolling in it? Yeah, dice rolling was tricky. There was always a little bit of dice rolling in this set. We knew it was D and D. Some of our one of our tenants in AFR was that if hey, if you're rolling a D twenty in Magic, it's gonna feel like D and D, um, and so that carried over a little bit. Um, one of the tricky parts about like the development for Battle for Baldur's Gate um, was mostly completely before AFR was released. So we knew that dice rolling in black border was kind of a you know we were confident that people would like it we were confident that people like people who like variants would enjoy it but uh we were still hesitant on how much they would like it and so uh we kept the dice rolling kind of at a minimal for a long time until afr released and we tried to up it a few cards because we thought it went over pretty well i think if we i think if we had been making the set later and we 
already had confidence in dice rolling, we would see a lot more of it in the set. But instead, we just see it more in the background of the set because we want to evoke that D&D feeling. But we were a little bit trepidatious about the reception of D20s without seeing the players play with it. Yeah, you, you bring up something that the audience might not be aware of, which was we had a lot of confidence in Adventures in Forgotten Realm, the first D&D uh, magic set. Um, but this product got started before the audience had seen the first one. So you guys were working somewhat in the dark. Um, but during set design, the set came out, right? So like you, you didn't finish set design before the original set came out. Yeah, we had uh, a few months, I think, after the set came out. It was definitely towards the end of the process that we saw AFR come out. Um, but I think we had a bit of time to react, um, which, w- which was good. You know, obviously, I wish I had been able to know more about AFR sooner. But, uh, I mean, I, I think we made a great D&D product. And I think, you know, dice rolling also adds a lot of complexity. And we approach dice rolling in a very different way here. Um because, you know, in, in AFR, you're drafting dice cards, and then you're going to go play, like, three or four rounds. And if you miss on a die card, on a die roll, then, like, the next time you play it, maybe you'll succeed. But in this this game, you're, like, CLB, you're drafting a huge deck full of, like, mostly singleton cards. Obviously, it's not all singleton because it's draft. But uh, you you when you draw your die rolling card, it's it's so much harder because you have such a bigger deck to draw that card. And you're usually just rolling the die once. And so if you fail, you're maybe you'll never roll that die again. And so there's a lot of little little differences in the die rolling here. I know that some of our die rolling cards, when they scale up, they don't scale up on effectiveness. They scale up on how many opponents they affect. So if you're trying to kill that creature or trying to affect this opponent, you can. And if you roll well, it just won't happen to hit everyone else which is kind of our way of giving the die rolling cards a meaningful floor and still an exciting ceiling. Um, and then some of our other die rolling cards, maybe maybe it's like an attack trigger or something. Um, I can't remember any specifics right now, but some of the philosophy was, okay, if one card gets to roll their dice mul- die multiple times, then uh, maybe that'll help that variance of if I failed and that's the only die roll I ever get. So, so I don't know. All in all, it was a little tricky to make, um, to react to, to make sure that it was satisfying. Um, but I like die rolling. I really like the dragons that roll a d20 and scale off that many. Like there's a, it's a mythic, a blue mythic where you get to roll a d20 and then whatever that result is, you draw that many cards. There's no table. If I roll a 19, I'm drawing 19 cards. So here, let me, uh, let me get the, the uh, which dragon is this? It's the blue dragon. What, what's the what's the name of the blue dragon? Seth? Oh, sorry, it's ancient silver dragon. Ancient silver dragon. Okay, so ancient silver dragon, six blue blue, uh, elder dragon, eight eight, flying. Whenever ancient silver dragon deals combat damage to a player, roll a d twenty, draw cards equal to the result. You have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. So this is a full cycle, right? Of, of dragons when they attack, you roll a d twenty. Yeah, there's there's a dragonish color there, um, and really just got in a room with one of my designers and we were just thinking about, hey, if we just roll a D20 and scale off of that number, what's the craziest stuff we can do? Yeah, and this is sort of fun. The, 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 uh, all of the AFR stuff and the rest of the cards outside the dragons have like the roll chart, right? You're rolling a D20 and it tells you what happens. But these are just, it's a scalable thing from 1 to 20 and you could you could roll 20 and draw 20 cards or whatever. Yeah, it takes some inspiration from, in AFR, the commander decks had cards that would roll um, different die, like a D6 or a D12 or a D10, um, which, by the way, shorthand for a 10-sided die or a 12-sided die or a 16-sided die. And then you would scale off of that number in some way. So the, the commander decks had explored the space a little bit, um, but not that much with a D20. And I didn't want to do different die types. I, I thought it was, you know, there's so much going on in the set already. I didn't want people to have to, like, get different dies or, or dice. So, uh... I liked taking that concept from AFR Commander and uh, scaling it up to the D20 and trying it out at, at some splashy effect. Okay, let's go on to the next component. Um, so one of the interesting things about Baldur's Gate is it has nine gates. Uh, and I think, was it were the gates in the vision design handoff or did you guys add gates later? No, it was in the vision design handoff. There was actually probably a larger presence of gate matters in the vision handoff than what ended up being true. 
Uh, there was a handful of green cards that cared more about Gates um, than what is true today. Um, but I liked Gates. It was a suggestion in, in the vision. It obviously was in the handoff. Um, I thought that I've always liked Gates as like a really background sub theme that you don't have to care about that much. Um, and then we got to make nine gates and it, it worked decently well. Like there was, um, the five common gates are close to the thriving lands in jumpstart. There are lands that enter the battlefield tapped. You choose a color, they tap for a native color. Like there's one for blue or one for white and the chosen color. So if I play the blue, the blue common gate it enters tapped and I can choose whatever second color it might tap for and it can tap for blue or that other color. Um, and those, I think, were really, really good fixing for um, for a Commander Legend set because you want your fixing lands to not be constrained by color identity too much. Um, or else, if I draft the red green land and I end up blue red, then hey, I can't play that land. But if I draft the red lands and I pivoted from red green to blue red, I could still play it, which was really useful. Um, and so those five gates, and then we made. Uh, Four other gates, where one of them is a rare that is really splashy. It's Baldur's Gates, go figure. And the other three were, I think it's two common and an uncommon. And they all had different gate rewards on the gates themselves. So if I'm drafting gates, you know, it's probably I'm drafting this land that is taking me there. So any deck could start drafting gates if they felt so inclined. You didn't need to be heavy multicolor like you usually do for these land-based decks. You could just uh, trap these colorless, uh, color identity lands or these uh, monocolor lands to start doing your gate stuff. And then we added a few uh, colorless um, gate rewards uh, on um, artifact creatures. We actually ended up reprinting Gate Colossus. Do you want to read Gate Colossus? Sure, I can read Gate Colossus. Uh, gate Colossus is... What color is Gate Colossus? It is colorless. It's a reprint. Oh, it's a colorless. Uh, Gay Colossus. Eight mana for an 8-8. Eight, eight. It's an artifact creature construct. This spell costs one less to cast for each gate you control. Gate Colossus can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. Whenever a gate enters the battlefield under your control, you may put Gate Colossus from your graveyard on top of your library. Yeah, for a long time, this was some other giant artifact creature that was trying to do something like Gate Colossus until we opened our eyes and learned how to love reprinting Great Gate Colossus, um, which made a lot more sense. The card is really sweet. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's like a Shield Guardian from D&D concepted on that card or something similar to that. But uh, I think Gates, very similar to Adventure, they were there, and then they stuck. And then we ended up making one legendary creature that that would fit Gates as well that I thought was fun. Uh, who was the legendary creature? Oh, yeah. Actually, it's kind of, yeah, it's Nine Fingers Keen. You can just look up Nine Fingers. Okay, Nine Fingers Keen. I got it. Uh, one black, green, blue. So four mana total. One black, one green, one blue of that. Four, four. Legendary creature, human rogue. Menace. Ward, pay nine life. Whenever nine figures keen deals combat damage to a player, look at the top nine cards in your library. You may put a gate card from among them onto the battlefield. Then if you control nine or more gates, put the rest into your hand. Otherwise, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Yeah, so typically, you know, gate fans out in the world, people who like gates are very used to 10, or sorry, five color gate decks. There are 10 Ravnican gates, there are you need to be in all five colors to play them. Um, I think there's maybe 11 Rapid and Gates, but you need to be on all five colors to play them. Uh, this is a three-color gate legend, which is really interesting. But with the nine gates and Baldur's Gate, in which if I was Sultai, I could play seven of them. And then with I could play seven of these gates, and then I could play the three gates from Ravnica... Um, that would fit Sultai, so it would be Demir, Golgari, and Simic. And then, so that would be 10 gates I could play my deck. And then maybe there's another gate that I'm, I'm forgetting, that, that 11th gate from Ravnica or something. But maybe I could play like 11 or 12 gates already. So in Constructed, I certainly can reach 9 gates in 3 color, which typically people would be like, you can't reach 9 gates in, multi, in, in 3 color, but you can here. And then... Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, and then in draft, because you can do multiples of gates, it's you can technically reach nine gates as well. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. So uh, I can see my desk here. So we're almost, I'm almost to work. Um, any final thoughts on the making of Battle for Baldur's Gate? Um, final thoughts? I'm not so sure. I have a lot of thoughts in general. So <laughs> if, you, if you want to ask any questions, I know I'm doing a, um, uh, you could just honestly tweet at me at, at uh, Corey J. Bowen, C-O-R-E-Y-J-B-O-W-E-N. And I'm happy to answer any questions about this set because I have nothing. I cannot stop talking about it. If you have a question <laughs> about it, I can say something about it. So what is, here's my final thought for you, which is, I understand you're proud of the set as a whole. There's lots of cool things going on. Um, what is the little detail that you might think people might not notice, but you think is just an awesome little detail in the set? Just an awesome little detail in the set. Something subtle that, that you're proud of, but it's subtle. So that people might not even notice it, but here, here's something cool that's there. There's so many little details. I feel like the set is made up of small little details and small little cards that interact with other little cards. Like here's this random artifact feature that is just doing some weird different thing, but it connects with like three or four different legends. It's hard to pick. It's hard to pick just one detail. So I'll, <laughs> I'll leave you with an unsatisfying. I love all of the tiny little details because there are so many tiny little details. The other thing the set does, by the way, speaking of tiny little details is there are a lot of references. Obviously, this is a and d, &D mm -hmm. licensed set. Um, and I know you guys spend a huge amount of time just making every reference you could everywhere you could. And so there's a lot of really fun D&D &D references for D&D &D fans. Yeah, I spent a lot of time researching Baldur's Gate stuff and common D&D &D tropes and stuff. So hope you guys like the flavor. But anyway, uh, I'm now at my desk, so we all know what that means. It means it's the end of my drive to work. So instead of talking magic, it's time for me to be making magic. So thanks, Corey. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. And to all of you, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.